So welcome to the Unicon Identity and Access Management webinar. If everybody can please put themselves on mute. We are planning to have an open forum at the end of this session uh, where you can unmute and obviously have some good collaboration and communication. So before we go into the agenda, I just wanted to mention, so we have a variety of people on this call, which I'm sure they'll continue to join as we get started. Um, initially, we've got our open source support subscribers, welcome. In addition to that, we invite um, community members, um, professional. we invite other clients that we work with from a professional services perspective, and really others that we know engage and are interested in CAS Shibboleth and Grouper. Um, these are the core applications we'll be talking about today, and the goal really is to hear about, to hear collaboration and to join in with other people and to find out, you know, who's using what, why, how can we improve it, continue with the sustainability, et cetera. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. So today what we are going to cover, um, basically the goals of the overall briefing are to make sure that you hear and understand some of the things that we've done through the program, which is the key reason for having this session. We do our best to meet twice a year. If time permits and there's work that we've been able to, that we're able to show you, we might meet more often, so look for those invites to come. Uh, but really it's to communicate what we've done as far as our sustaining engineering, which in reality is development that we contribute back to the community on behalf of our open source support subscribers. In addition to that, we're going to talk about some of our professional services clients who also have um, been willing to have their work donated out into the community. So you'll hear from time to time that that'll be mentioned. Uh, we're going to touch on some highlights from the community, some events that have happened, um, and then overall just to make sure that you're aware of um, you know, all the things that are happening out in the community. It's a lot, of, a lot to keep up with, so we try to pull the highlights. As I mentioned, as we wrap up, we'll have an open forum session. So please keep um, everything on mute as we go through these different pieces. Um, there will be open time for questions as we get to the end of each section, but that'll make it easy for everybody to really hear and, and understand the content. All right, to do some introductions, we are going to have Mike Grady, who is going to be discussing shibboleths, followed by Dmitry Kopolinko. He will own the CAV content. And then John Gasper, who will talk to us about Grouper. So before we get into those details, I'm going to talk a little bit about events. So just recently in April, the 2017 Internet 2 Global Summit occurred. I'm sure a lot of you were there. A lot of activity, a lot of topics. These are just some of the highlights that we brought back and thought it might be notable to go ahead and mention here in our discussion. So the, there were several um, demos, a lot of work going on with TIER, some of the things that were discussed specifically on, around Grouper were the deployment guide, and that's near and dear to our heart, um, led by Bill Thompson. Um, the goal here is really to make people not just aware, they know it's out there, but to really make it more streamlined and easy for people to understand what it is. It's nothing but easy, right, which is why this Grouper deployment guide was created. Um, it starts at a very high level, explains what's going on all the way down to the details and configuration to help give people more of a comfort level with the end result goal of using the tool. Um, in addition to that, there were other discussions around some lightweight documentation that might, might be used for the other products, such as Shibboleth, Co-Manage, et cetera. Um, but the next big area that we noted was the discussion around the packaging, specifically using Docker images. Um, this is obviously some new technology that's been out there for quite a bit, but a lot of people are just starting to dibble dabble in that. Um, Unicon is assisting with some of the validation as the tier team works forward um, to enhance the packaging that they have in place and all towards, again, to assist with that overall sustainability and continuation of usage with these tools that exist today. Um, and then as a note there on the side, um, additionally, they're looking at picking up that consent work and including it specifically within Shibboleth, um, which brings us to the next section. And then the overall goal that you can see here is really what they're looking for is to make sure that not only people continue to be aware that Shibboleth is a, a core tool that is of value, but that there is a lot of people that care about it, want to continue to see the growth so that people continue to use it and pick it up. I mean, there's other open source products where there's competition that's kind of picking up. Um, there's additional functionality that's being seen in different areas that kind of overlap with Shibboleth. So specifically, they're looking at all the tools, not just Shibboleth, but co-manage, grouper. What can we do to enhance um, the, the sustainability, the desire for people to understand and know the tools and want to use them and talk about it and continue to help us grow, right? This is a community. 
So it's not just one group. It's not just here. We need to help as a community to see what we can do um, to enhance the product, fix the issues, and really fill the gaps that are out there. And again, that's something please think about during our open forum. Raise those items that you thought about that you want to, you know, have some feedback from the people on the call as well as from the Unicon team. And, and just a final note here as I move on, uh, really at the, the Global Summit, for the first time it was my understanding that uh, there was actually discussion on the trust and identity as a, 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 a front, I guess, for, um, what am I saying here, excuse me, just um, something that really hadn't been a major topic at these sessions was just overall trust and identity and how important that is um, as a whole and what people are looking into and what their needs are. Um, so there was lots of discussion on contributions from a variety of different people and how to, again, um, just validate the tools that are out there and the importance of, of these pieces and us coming together to make these the best products that we can. So everybody get out there, virtual calendars, and let's look at what's coming up. So in early June, we have a Perio 2017 in Philadelphia, followed by a couple workshops for Shibliss. Now these are key. If you haven't been to these, you should check, check them out, see what's in your neighborhood. Um, these are where you can really engage and be hands-on as well as do a lot of collaboration. So we encourage you to look at those. One in mid-June and then followed um, in late jo July, excuse me, hosted by Lafayette College. Following that in October is the Internet 2 2017 Technology Exchange in San Francisco. And then we head into Educause in October. And then we wrap the year up with the In Common Shibboleth Workshop. So check your calendars if you have questions about these, what might be best for you to attend. Reach out to the community, reach out to people on the call, feel free to reach out to Unicon. Um, the more involvement, the more collaboration is only going to enhance the tools for everyone. All right, with that, we're going to shift over to the IAM Trends, and I'm going to introduce Mike Grady. Hi, this is, uh, this is Mike Grady. Uh, the, the trends haven't changed dramatically since uh, we had the last one of these webinars. I think most of these bullets to you, if you went back and looked at the, our last uh, webinar, would be the same. I mean, if, um, and I would imagine most of these aren't surprising to you that um, MFA continues to be um, <clears throat> talked about, um, uh, required uh, you know, lots of uh, exchange on the, the various user lists around Shibboleth and CAS um, about how do I do this, how do I do that, how do I configure MFA to be um, for this, these select users, uh, for these select services. And, and we, there's also uh, you know, the interest, and there's been a little bit of chatter, not as much, around the, the general risk-based adaptive auth end, where you consider a number of factors, where the user's coming from, maybe where the user came from last, and does uh, something about this interaction seem riskier, and then at that point, you, uh, you require uh, an additional form of authentication. Open ID Connect, OAuth 2, uh, there's uh, strong interest that, you know, there's been strong interest in the broader IAM space, uh, but now we're seeing very strong interest in the, uh, in the higher ed space and, and with the tier effort uh, looking at um, uh, APIs uh, that they're defining for the components that communicate and, and pretty much figuring they're going to use OAuth 2 for the authentication authorization around the APIs. Um, the, uh, also, there was the survey done by the, by, uh, in common, and that's on, there's a work plan item uh, for the in common technical advisory committee this year to, uh, to do a lot of work around how OpenID Connect can be scalable in a federation model that would align with what we're used to being able to do with SAML and in common and that and that scaling trust uh, how would we do that with open id connect so uh, a lot of work going on in that space metadata query protocol uh if you're you know you're using uh, uh in common metadata you know how that continues to grow greatly in size you know that that requires a very large memory footprint that the SHIB software would not otherwise require um in common is working towards uh supporting a production metadata uh, query service 
uh, the SHIB software, uh, simple SAML software, um, uh, CAS5 all have support for using that. That's a just-in-time DNS type model. When you need the metadata for a service, you go off and say, hey, can I get metadata for this service? Uh, that will have the advantage of then allowing you to run the software with a much smaller memory footprint. Mobile app and API authentication, I already mentioned here, uh, looking at uh, seriously at, you know, how, how are these APIs that are being defined for the various tier components to communicate uh, going to be um, authenticated, authorized, uh, and mobile app, uh, you know, a lot of, there's, of course, there's been a lot of interest, continues to be a lot of interest in what, what is the model going forward for that. Uh, uh, there's some evidence that that's settling in on uh, on, on a web service that the apps can talk to using OpenID Connect, but uh, that's it's still a moving target. Tier uh, again, Sharice already mentioned there were demos of the of the current state of the the packages that Tier delivering delivering using Docker uh, for Shib for CoManage for Grouper. Uh, and broadly looking at, again at how these new components in terms of a person registry provisioning engine, how, how will that all fit together and how will it be packaged to make it easy for you to deploy? And then cloud deployments, you know, again, seeing a lot of, seeing institutions more seriously considering moving their IAM services into the cloud, whether that's running them on cloud servers themselves, whether that's having a hosted service like Unicon provides. Area, if you weren't running the latest release, uh, say that they weren't going to, to delve into it further. Um, the, uh, there just was, if you didn't otherwise see, if you were on the ship announced list, you would have seen just on, I think yesterday, the announcement about a potential security problem if you're using Kerberos for your authentication from the IDP. Uh, so if you haven't looked at that and you are using Kerberos, now if you're using the standard LDAP connectivity, you're not impacted. It's only if you're using the Kerberos protocol whether it's through the JAS, uh, JAS um, connector or um, the uh, internally in the IDP, not, not the, the um, SP negotiate uh, feature. You're okay there, I believe. But do, if you are using Kerberos, do look at that. If you have any questions or concerns or you're not sure if you're impacted, of course, uh, feel free to uh, contact us, open a ticket. Um, ask uh, ask questions and then there was a besides on Windows there was a 3.3.1.1 that was because they uh, it, with the embedded jetty that you can install as part of Windows if you were doing a new install it wasn't creating a needed directory that jetty needed to run a, a, a temp directory uh, that jetty needed so the, that was why there was that additional point release of, uh, of Windows. On the service provider, there's not been a lot of work in the last uh, couple of years. The current stable release on Linux is still 2.6, which came out in the middle of last year. On Windows, there was a point release of that to update some of the underlying Windows library dependencies, so some of the underlying dependencies of the SP, uh, but didn't change the SP functionality in any way. So that's where we stand in terms of the current uh, supported stable releases of the ship software. In terms of 3.3.1, the, uh, it, it came out not long after 3.3 and uh, a potential way of bypassing second factor. If you had a flow that had several uh, uh, steps to it, there, there was a way that you could, after you've done first factor, get around having to do second factor and get the IDP to skip a step. Uh, so that's what 331 fixed. Now, if you don't, if you don't have any multi-step authentication flows, you're, uh, as far as is known, you're not impacted, but of course it's always good to upgrade to the latest release. Um, 
And because there's nothing suspected that could be compromised if you didn't have, a, if you were just doing a single step authentication, um, it doesn't necessarily mean there couldn't have been some other underlying consideration. So if you haven't considered upgrading it to 331, you, you should have it uh, in your plans. The um, built-in, oh, and, and then on Windows, say it was, uh, uh, that was, I already mentioned the fix for that. So in terms of what was new in 3.3, uh, there is support built into the software now for multi-factor authentication. Actually, the, the flow, the, the configuration file is labeled as MFA, but basically it's a composable flow. So you could potentially, I mean, you're using it to be able to stitch together multiple different things to happen, um, most likely around authentication. But it, it, you think of it as an easy way of saying, hey, I want this to happen, and then after that happened, I want this to happen. And again, included with the software now is support for Duo. So at this point, uh, with, with changes in the architecture, in the underlying architecture from 3.2 to 3.3, Unicon's Duo extension will not work with 3.3. Um, and we, we looked at whether there was anything it could do for a reason why we should port it forward to still work. And that did not seem to be a worthwhile effort for us or for the community. It was better for folks to transition to the built-in support on that. There's also support for limiting password attempts in the IDP. You can now configure the IDP to say, hey, after the user tries five unsuccessful times, I want you to go to sleep for five minutes and before they can enter, try again. Um, so that, that is native now in the IDP that you can configure that support. It's not turned on by default, but it's easy to configure. There are changes in the attribute resolver in the namespacing and schema. So if, you've, if you want to go back into your resolver, you can remove most of the namespace, the resolver colon, the ENC colon. You can go back and simplify your resolver file by removing a lot of cruft from the file, which leaves it a little easier to look at and see the, the functionality of it that you're really focused on. Uh, Unicons contributed back uh, some tweaks for accessibility and the default views that, that were included in uh, the, the, the uh, velocity templates that came out with 3.3. And there's also, it's easy to overlook, and it was just highlighted on the, on the user list uh, within the last couple of weeks. There's support for local file-based dynamic resolution of metadata. So it's, it, it's akin to metadata query protocol, except you can if you store a file by hashing the name correctly in a particular directory without having to add new config to your metadata provider, um, you can have it pick up metadata for a new local file that you've added for metadata. So you don't have to tell it, hey, reread the metadata, you know, tweak the metadata provider file and reread it to get metadata used. So that's, uh, if you manage a lot of local files and you'd like that to be a little bit more dynamic and have to change the config, the metadata provider config less frequently, uh, that's a feature you probably want to look at. Lots of uh, new objects, beans, configuration files. The details are highlighted there in those links. Uh, and, and a few warnings about if you did this kind of, if you've got your IDP configured for this kind of advanced functionality or that kind of advanced functionality, uh, noting a few things that you might have to change when you upgrade from 3.2 to, to uh, 3.3. Um, and so the links are there for uh, both going to, um, well, if you're going from 3.2, you'd want to look at the notes for both 3.3 and 3.3.1 uh, because they both, they, they, they aren't duplicative in, in the things that they highlight. You'd need to account for both if you're jumping from 3.2. In terms of community-sponsored work in the ship space, the key thing is OpenID Connect, the University of Chicago um, is uh, uh, responsible for the, the work. Uh, they had Unicon create OpenID Connect support for the SHIB IDP. Um, it's, it's still, uh, the, there's been recent chatter on the list. It looks like there are more uh, universities starting to look at that support, including the University of Michigan. 
Uh, so uh, that's uh, be interesting to continue to watch to see how that uh, how that gets used by the community. But University of Chicago is uh, can be thanked for that uh, the existence of that. In terms of Unicon's own sustaining engineering effort, we continue to maintain SHIBCAS auth N3, the, the the software that allows you to layer the IDP over. Um, uh, CAS, uh, and there's been some enhancements to that to, to make sure that you can pass from, from uh, SHIB to CAS, you can pass through the entity ID of the SP so that you can use your CAS service registry entries to trigger whether that service requires MFA, and harking back to that interest in MFA. Uh, and and a few uh, a few other tweaks to that. So we continue to uh, update that as needed, so it continues to work with the latest releases of SHIB and CAS, and we continue to add enhancements to it uh, where it's clear the community would like those enhancements because of the functionality that they need. Um, continue to maintain the Hazelcast storage service as an option for a backend storage service for uh, SHIB. Um, there's also a Gradle overlay and Docker images that Unicon produces. Uh, uh, again, we've, we've seen, you know, folks in the community uh, pick up the Docker images that are interested in moving to Docker, picking up Unicon's Docker images is the way they want to deploy uh, Docker. I mean, deploy Docker, deploy, deploy the IDP using Docker. Uh, we, as I already mentioned, we've provided uh, some accessibility related UI tweaks and we continue to look at, you know, if there's other areas that we can help with in terms of the, in the UI that's embedded in the IDP. And as I noted, as of version 3.3 uh, 3 of the IDP, we consider the Duo support to be retired, the, the Unicon uh, Duo extension. Things that we are planning to do in sustaining engineering side is a security analysis of Shibboleth. We, you know, realize that there there hasn't really been an effort to step back and, and do a threat model of of, of the Shibboleth software and, and say SAML more broadly and and, a, and code analysis and other types of recommended uh, activities uh, under uh, OWASP uh, the that would be useful for the community to increase its confidence in the software. There was an effort in CAS in the past called App, App, AppSec, Application Security, and we're thinking that we'd follow that same model with the SHIB software, and we're, we've been talking with the tier uh, community about it because there is a tier security and audit working group, and so we're we're looking at their preliminary, not yet public report, um, so that we align well with what they're thinking needs to happen in terms of, of more effort spent on the tier components in terms of analyzing their security up front. We're continuing to consider what and how we can help with a UI for managing SHIB. Um, we're looking at, you know, are there some, some things we could do for the community that would aid in reporting, reporting and monitoring? And also continuing to consider, are there other storage back ends that the community would find useful for the SHIB software like Redis? The next version of the IDP is due out in quarter four of 2017. It'll be 3.4. A couple of things that have already been highlighted that would be in, in 3.4 are there on, on the slide. The, uh, a couple of more way, in terms of configuring trust for TLS protected uh, resources that you might be pulling into the IDP. Uh, with, you know, if you're pulling in an external filter file uh, or other types of resources. Uh, key pinning of LDAP connections and uh, metadata uh, a little tweak just to help. It, there still continue to be folks who don't fully realize that when you install the IDP, it generates metadata about itself, but that's a static file and nothing else changes it unless you go in and edit it. So the idea is let's go ahead and put a valid until date of, of the date you install so, 
so that it essentially makes that metadata unusable unless you actually go in and, 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 and edit it. Uh, there is now finally again on the roadmap, uh, you know, already uh, committed to doing uh, on the committed work section of the roadmap to go back and do some more work on the SP. The SP has kind of been on hold while the, the core SHIB team focused on the IDP3 series. Uh, so if you look on the committed work section on the SHIB consortium site in quarter one, 2018, uh, there's work that's intended uh, to produce an SP version three and a module specifically for IIS seven plus. So if you run the, ID, uh, the SP on IIS, you still have to install like IIS six, six compatibility libraries because it's never been upgraded to take advantage of later releases of uh, underlying dependencies on the Windows system. Thank you, Mike. Uh, before we move on to discussion on CAS, are there any specific questions on Shiblet? I hear some communication. Okay, just please stay on mute until we get to the next section, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. With that, I'd like to introduce Dmitry Kopolinko. Uh, thank you, Cherise. Uh, Mike, check. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Yes, yes we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Cherise. And um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dimitri Kapolenko, and also known as Dima. And um, I will um, uh, do the overview of uh, work that has been done uh, on the uh, CAS uh, side of things. Um, uh, I want to start with. Uh, reviewing the uh, current generation of uh, CAS server, which is version five. Um, uh, th this, uh, the, the highlights uh, basically of, uh, of this uh, version uh, of current generation of uh, CAS, uh, basically uh, CAS five is an overhauled, uh, overhauled its internal architecture uh, and uh, configuration management, uh, basically to make it easier uh, for deployers to maintain and, and configure. Um, uh, the, the current configuration strategy that CAS uses is so-called intention-driven. So basically, uh, deployer of CAS expresses their intention to use any available feature of CAS by declaring the dependency on the corresponding module, because CAS 5 is hi highly modularized implementation. Uh, and then uh, uh, configure uh, that module with uh, uh, um, you know set of simple properties uh, uh, in, the, in the property file format, um, and that that's a basic notion of intention driven uh, configuration management that CAS five uh, generation carries uh, forward. No more dealing with internal uh, bean definition, XML, and and, and uh, other internal parts of uh, low-level parts of CAS server. So that, that's the overall uh, um, goal of CAS 5, uh, simplified configuration management. Uh, also, uh, some of the features, major features that CAS 5 introduced, uh, CAS version 5 adds an implementation for uh, OpenID uh, Connect protocol uh, for both client and a server, right? Uh, meaning that uh, uh, CAS could delegate authentication to another OpenID provider or act uh, itself as an OpenID provider. So that's, that's another major feature that's been added to uh, version five. Uh, then uh, CAS5 uh, also uh, introduced implementation of the uh, uh, multi-factor authentication facility as a first class citizen, uh, basically native, native facility in CAS with uh, uh, multiple um, MFA providers implementations uh, available out of the box. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, dual security, YubiKey, Radius, uh, and Google Authenticator. Uh, also, uh, CAS5 added uh, support uh, for, uh, with, uh, with auto configuration for uh, uh, several well known SAML2 service providers. Uh, right? Because uh, CAS5 uh, also implements uh, a SAML2. 
uh, web SSO profile and could add itself as a uh, SAML uh, identity provider. And, uh, and along with that, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, out of the box comes several providers uh, for SV uh, with auto configuration, for example, such as Dropbox, Salesforce, uh, WebEx, uh, Workday, just to name a few. Uh, also, CAS5 generation um, also uh, rebuilt its uh, UI layer from, from the uh, ground up on top of a um, project called uh, TimeLeaf template engine, right? Uh, basically, TimeLeaf is a modern HTML5 natural template. Uh, uh, it's a Java-based implementation, and to make, to make it easier for uh, user interface uh, uh, specialists and designers customize uh, CASA's look and feel. So that's the overview of, of uh, uh, CAS version 5 uh, uh, generation. Uh, now I just want to talk about uh, uh, the, the next major feature release of CAS 5, uh, uh, w which uh, uh, development team of CAS has been uh, working hard to bring forward this next uh, feature release of CAS 5. And also uh, Unicon used uh, 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 sustaining engineering uh, a time to, to also contribute uh, to this release. Um, and uh, I just want to mention this release is uh, almost ready to be uh, generally available and the current target schedule is June 2017. So a few, few more weeks. Um, and I just want to overview some of the, some of the uh, exciting uh, features of this uh, uh, release. Um, uh, KS51 brings a uh, risk-based authentication. Uh, so basically this facility uh, allows KS server uh, to detect suspicious and potentially uh, fraudulent authentication requests, uh, uh, basically based on base, uh, past user behavior that's uh, 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 been collected uh, through various uh, past authentication events, statistics, etc. And it could calculate a uh, uh, cumulative uh, risk score, right? That is uh, a weight against, uh, you know, risk thresh threshold set by CAS operator. It's highly configurable. And, uh, and for example, in the event that the authentication attempt is considered risky by this calculation, um, uh, uh, well beyond the risk threshold, for example, CAS may be uh, allowed to take action and mitigate that risk. And it's all highly uh, uh, configurable with different strategies. Um, also, uh, CAS 5.1 uh, against uh, several uh, ticket registry implementations, uh, such as uh, Redis, uh, MongoDB, and uh, DynamoDB, right? So that adds uh, uh, to an array of already available ticket registry implementations and uh, basically options uh, to choose from, uh, from, from these various uh, backend uh, stores. Also, CAS 5.1 tightens uh, uh, security around its various available uh, administrative uh, HTTP endpoints that's available. So uh, the security is tightened there. Um, oh, CAS 5.1 um, implements uh, um, a flexible facility uh, uh, allowing to define a multiple principal attribute repository sources by a, a, a ubiquitous CAS properties file, right? In, in 5.0 uh, version, the, there was no such facility. Now the flexibility is, is, has been added there. Um, also, CAS 5.1 adds uh, an implementation for scripted attributes release uh, with, support, uh, with support of uh, Groovy, JavaScript, and Python. Uh, and basically, uh, that allows to satisfy more uh, complex uh, attribute release use cases that, that folks might have. And, um, and also, uh, 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 Sherry, if we could go back one, one, uh, uh, the, uh, just uh, uh, one uh, final uh, note there. Uh, Five one also um, introduces a, a Spring Boot based CAS admin server. Right, it's a, it's a separate web application that is uh, uh, able to to uh, you know expose available. Uh, CAS server metrics to an operator and manage its internal state visually. 
So that, that's a very uh, a cool and nice feature. And, and, and much, much more. There's a, a, a lot more features there, and those are just a, a few highlights. And, and here, um, uh, here I just want to overview some of, some of the uh, other sustaining engineering time that's, that's uh, uh, been uh, used to, to introduce the, some of the uh, tools, uh, various tools uh, around CARES. Um, for example, first bullet is the uh, a library called uh, a Spring, uh, Spring Boot uh, or a, a config support for uh, a CAS client. Uh, and basically, it's uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the library to secure Spring Boot based applications via a standard Java client uh, as easy as possible. So the idea here, basically, you have a Spring Boot application with one annotation and few simple properties. Uh, application is secure with a CAS client without uh, a lot of uh, web XML ceremony there. Um, another, another work that's been done is a, a command line tool called Dot. Uh, basically, it's a, a simple command line script to, to uh, uh, do simple smoke tests uh, to test correctness of deployment uh, and set up of a distributed ticket registry, uh, basically deployed on multiple nodes. Uh, uh, another, uh, another item there, there's a CAS CTL. It's the, it's the uh, fairly recent, uh, uh, recent addition. It's a new experimental uh, command line tool uh, to access uh, various CAS5 administrative endpoints. So if uh, folks like to use uh, you know, command line tools, that, that's, that's the option there available. And also uh, the, the last one is actually, uh, it's the uh, fairly recent experimental uh, implementation of a, a Spring, Cl Spring Cloud a stream facility uh, that's uh, basically configured to pub publish uh, CAS events in, in the JSON for format to an external messaging broker, right? And uh, rather than queue in, in this case. Um, it's, uh, it's the proof of concept implementation. And uh, if uh, there is an there is a interest uh, uh, and, and demand, uh, now this facility could be added to a future uh, CAS release. All right, and uh, the, this, uh, this page basically uh, uh, lists uh, a few CAS resources, uh, uh, you know, worth, worthwhile bookmarking. Uh, uh, the first one is the uh, uh, clear and official CAS project maintenance policy uh, describing maintenance and management of release CAS server versions. So I'd highly recommend, uh, you know, bookmarking and, and, and uh, Having having that uh, uh, URL handy, so it talks about uh, official uh, gas maintenance uh, policies. Um, and also, uh, last but not least, is the uh, Aperio uh, blog. It's a, it's a fairly new blog a resource hosted on GitHub pages, and uh, that blog contains many many uh, uh, CAS uh, project related entries describing. Uh, CAS features in greater detail. So um, I highly recommend this bookmarking it and uh, reading it. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dima. Um, are there any specific questions on CAS before we move on to the next subject? All right. We'll continue to be mute till we get to our open forum. With that, I'd like to introduce John Gasper, who will talk to us about Grouper. Hello, all. Uh, so I had the opportunity to attend uh, Internet 2's Global Summit uh, just a few weeks ago and attended the Grouper Birds of, uh, Birds of a Feather. So there's a few things that I wanted to highlight from there. Um, I guess I'll just start by, by letting you know that uh, Grouper 2.3 is still the latest version. Uh, they don't do regular releases uh, like uh, CAS or SHIB uh, does. It, they tend to do uh, patches. Uh, so some weeks you may have two or three, um, others you may have uh, may have just one. Uh, but some of the, the latest functionality that's been released in some of these uh, later patches is uh, support for instrumentation. They're tracking things like the grouper, uh, the number of 
request to the grouper UI, servlet, number of group add deletes, folder add deletes, membership add deletes, and that's visible uh, through the grouper uh, UI now. Uh, the, there's a real-time loader, so if you're familiar with grouper, uh, you're, you're familiar with the loader process, which basically pulls, say, for example, coursework from your student system, populates it into uh, grouper as, as dynamic uh, groups. The problem with it is that it's been a full sync every time you need to uh, do on that process. With the real-time loader that they've recently introduced, it gives you the ability to do uh, uh, basically deltas or what they're calling real-time uh, implementations. So the idea is you do have to do a little bit of back-end work on your database. You will need to uh, have a table that captures incremental updates. Um, you'll have a, you'll have to have some triggers that populate uh, the, the, this incremental table. And then the loader job will look for those keys, um, identify the change processes, uh, the changed uh, items, and then uh, sync those. So instead of taking an hour or two to run through the full sync just to change one or two items, um, we can now do uh, one or two items within just a few seconds. Uh, there is the ability to do, uh, to, to manage and uh, uh, configure um, loader jobs in the user interface now. Uh, we also have something called attestation which I actually had to look up what that actually meant. It's French for uh, certification or certify. And that is a feature where you can require group admins to review uh, the membership of a particular group. So perhaps you have a sensitive knowing if you've got it just right and tweaking it so that the, the various uh, attributes and names um, pop up appropriately. Uh, this new functionality makes it much easier. Uh, I do believe there is a UI uh, component to that that allows you to uh, see, you know, how's the display name going to look, uh, check out the various attributes that are pulled uh, using a test uh, subject, and uh, uh, going to be very helpful as, as you're tweaking. Um, the subject uh, configuration has been, um, or at least optionally, can be migrated to uh, hierarchical property files, so you don't have to deal with um, you know, kind of the nastiness of the XML. You can now use uh, the property files just like uh, the rest of Grouper uh, uses. Uh, that is also true for the ehcache.xml file uh, if you've gone in and, and made configuration changes to that. Um, the PSPNG has had uh, some uh, additional work done to it. So if you're still working with the old uh, PSP, um, I uh, recommend highly that you give the PSPNG a, uh, a look. It's definitely a bre uh, breath of fresh air if you're trying to uh, make configuration changes. Uh, it's much, much easier, although still not quite as flexible. Um, so I guess there is a trade-off between the PSP and the PSP uh, NG, uh, but it's definitely um, worth looking at. And they are uh, looking at expanding its use uh, to things uh, such as, uh, I think they were looking at um, even something like the, the Azure, Office 365, Google, uh, the G Suite, and, and Dropbox, moving those to be supported through the PSP NG versus the uh, standard change log consumers that are out there now. Uh, so Sharice did mention in the in the intro, the uh, grouper deployment guide, uh, definitely worth taking a look, especially if you are a newer uh, deployer, along with step-by-step -step, uh, instructions and, and guidance. Uh, there is um, guidance on the taxonomy of how should you lay out your, your uh, folder structure and your group structure and, and naming conventions and whatnot. Uh, so along with, with you know, kind of help in, in getting things installed and getting it up and running for the first time, uh, the goal was really to, to have kind of a community guideline that we would uh, follow so that uh, implementations look fairly similar, which would make support and doing uh, some additional, you know, customizations, enhancements, et cetera, 
making those um, uh, consistent across uh, deployers. Because uh, right now, I guess kind of the saying is there's more than one way to skin a cat. Grouper, there tends to be at least two or three. And uh, it's not always, yeah, having a single one makes it much easier for folks to, uh, to, to share code and share ideas with. So there is a half day grouper training coming up at Open Aperio. Uh, if you've got some time and you're, you're near the East Coast, uh, Bill Thompson uh, and Chris Heiser. Uh, Chris Heiser is the, uh, the grouper uh, project lead. And uh, Bill Thompson, many of you probably know, used to work at Unicons now at Lafayette, but he's also the author of the grouper deployment guide. They will be the trainers. And I've heard a rumor that they will be serving free food. Uh, so, uh, I mean, why wouldn't you want to want to go? Um, but if for some reason you can't make it and you or you would like an on-site uh, training, Unicon would be glad to uh, to work with you and, and get a training scheduled for you in the house. Uh, we've been working with many of um, the various adopters that we have, and in the last few months, we have uh, used some of the components that were already public, or now that we've we formally um, uh, published those. So the first one to mention is the Google Apps, the G Suite provisioner. It's now technically part of the Grouper um, uh, project, so you won't see it. Well, you'll still see it in the Unicon uh, repo, but uh, you should go pull it from the uh, the Internet too. A repository that uh, was originally sponsored by Oregon State, and uh, thanks to um, contributions to Columbia Uni or from Columbia University, uh, we've um, I've been able to do some uh, enhancements to that, getting it up to support the latest properties and and whatnot that uh, Google supports. Um, the external subjects uh, user enhancement was also sponsored by Columbia. They uh, basically had a need where they've got um, external users that they want to import and include in Google Groups, and they needed to, to have a nice, easy way for um, uh, users to just be able to type in a person's name when they add them into the group, be able to type in a person's name and uh, an email address and just have them added. So instead of using the built-in uh, functionality um, for external users, which, which was definitely overkill for what they needed, um, this was something that, uh, that um, they sponsored, so that's available for your use. Uh, the subject customizer is a um, plugin for Grouper that allows you to restrict and redact um, uh, information about the various subjects that are being queried and added to groups. Uh, the, for example, perhaps maybe alumni or your purpose students need to be treated differently with regards to what attributes are visible. Um, I think we initially did that for Notre Dame, and um, since then, uh, UC Berkeley sponsored some work to uh, really to revamp that, and so it's much more flexible, much more dynamic uh, than to be. Um, and then, uh, also sponsored by University of Notre Dame, um, they graciously allowed us to open source this. It is a Google to Grouper group mi migration uh, toolkit, I guess, if you want to call it that. Essentially, uh, there's uh, a process that you can run, a Python app, that will extract all of your uh, Google groups. You have the ability to, to massage the JSON um, that was produced by that extraction. And then there is, uh, I guess you can call them sample scripts. They technically, um, I think, do work. But you would probably want to massage those scripts a bit to clean things up uh, for your specific implementation. And uh, you can import those groups uh, into Grouper. So if you're changing who the system of record um, is for, for those groups, um, that process would allow you to, to do that. Uh, sustaining Thanks. engineering, can I have you jump back, Therese? Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so Unicon has been uh, doing some uh, just kind of independent uh, work over the last uh, little bit. Uh, we're still doing, we still have the Docker uh, container. So if you're looking at rolling out with just kind of a standard Docker um, implementation, uh, there's the composable project out there, which has all the modules isolated um, with an example of how you might stand those up uh, in, in concert. Um, that has been recently updated uh, with uh, almost all of the, the uh, Grouper patches. There may be a week's work that's missing, uh, but those will be in in the next day or so. 
Uh, the grouper demo uh, for Docker is a self-contained image that allows you to, uh, you know, has a database built into it, has um, a simple uh, LDAP with, I think there's about a thousand um, kind of quasi-student staff members in there. Uh, so it's really good for just kicking the tires on, on grouper. Uh, but also if you're doing development with grouper, it's really, really um, good for adding into your flow. Um, you can uh, apply your enhancements locally. Uh, you know, decide that you're, uh, you're, you know, that it worked or didn't work, and um, iterate over over things really uh, quickly. So the recent updates to this uh, project is that it used to be that it spun up all of the various components, um, and now you have the option of uh, you know not starting. You know, maybe you're just working on a, a, a daemon component, uh, so you, maybe you don't want to spin up uh, Tomcat uh, for web services and UI. Or perhaps you're just working on um, a UI, so you don't need web services to start up, and you don't need the, the uh, daemon to start up, which will spin off the built-in uh, PSP uh, and uh, loader jobs. Uh, so you, you have the ability to disable those at startup, which um, it makes things a little easier as you're trying to, to iterate. Uh, there is also the ability to add on um, uh, when you're starting up and uh, instantiating the, um, the, the container to build out the tier layout for uh, what was recommended under the deployment guide. Uh, so um, that's now available as a, a an environmental switch that you can specify a command line when you're starting the container. Uh, there is a custom provisioning target form, uh, which is, uh, I think that was also uh, Notre Dame, and we've continued to work under that through our sustaining engineering. Um, some minor updates uh, to that um, were made a few months ago. The Azure AD provisioner or Office 365 provisioner, uh, we've not done any changes since uh, Microsoft initially um, uh, sponsored that work. However, I know it is on our uh, timeline uh, probably this year to get that updated. Uh, Microsoft has been changing some of their internal APIs. And so it, uh, I don't believe it is currently working. At least that's my understanding. Um, but uh, hopefully within a few months, that is something that, uh, that will be working. Thank you, John. All right, this brings us near the end of the hour. We have about five minutes um, for any questions, comments. We'd love to hear anything that you have to say. A lot of content was covered. Mike, Dima, John, anything you want to add? No, nothing, uh, nothing else that comes to mind that I uh, suddenly thought, oh, I wish I had men mentioned this. Yeah, I guess I'll just, uh, if I can throw out a quick poll and folks can just uh, reply in the chat room. Uh, how many of our attendees today are, are running uh, Grouper? How many are running CAS? How many are running SHIB? You wouldn't mind just throwing out a quick note, you know, telling us what you're running. Um, I, I'm just curious to know, you know, what our what makeup our audience is looking like. This is also a great time to bring up any specific enhancements or concerns you might have about the applications that you'd like to get some feedback on. If there's anything that you want to bring up now, perfect time. You've got a good forum. The um the other thing, Sharice, that I guess we didn't mention, I guess we, we want to add it in uh, for next time, hadn't thought about this, uh, is we now do have a support program for simple SAML PHP. That's, that's relatively new. Um, we've, we've, we've been doing a fair amount of work with it uh, for the IDP proxy use case. Um, not, not generally as just your main IDP or SP, although you can, you know, there are lots of folks who use it for that. And it works perfectly well for that. But uh, the, the particular niche we found that it works brilliantly at is if you have that need for an IDP proxy, a gateway between uh, SPs and a number of, uh, of IDPs or even other types of authentication sources on the other side of the proxy. So just to highlight, we have that now if anybody's interested in, in learning more about it. 
Thanks, Mike. Anything comes to mind? We just, we're just at, about at the top of the hour. We appreciate you joining us. Um, we will capture some follow-up, uh, do what we can to put this presentation up on our website so that you have access to all of the details. It's a lot of information to take in all at once. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, uh, please feel free to send them our way and we'll send off responses. Thank you all very much for attending and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.